So today I thought I would do something a little bit different from my normal video. I really wanted to break down the thought process that I use to create pop guitar parts. So this is gonna be a really deep dive video. It's made to be more of like a reference material. So slightly different than what I've done in the past. I've made a full PDF that will be a free download in the description, but I'm also gonna be walking through my thought process on how I use it and how you can use it to write really simple, effective guitar parts for pop music. By the way, this video did kind of take a long time to make. So uh, if you enjoyed it and you would like more content like this, hit the subscribe, do all that stuff below. But something I want to get out of the way really quickly is that this is made to be a practical guitar lesson. So my thought process when teaching guitar stuff is whatever is practical is the most important. So with these chord shapes, they're technically not correct in terms of it will be a G or a D minor, but instead of a major, it could be a sus, add nine slash 11. And my thought process with this video is I want people to be able to make songs. So if that means I jump into using the tools first without a completely accurate explanation, I would rather do that than spend five hours explaining things perfectly in a music theory accurate way, but then it doesn't really have any practical application. And I say this as somebody who went to music college. So for anybody coming at me saying that I should take the time to learn how to do things correctly, just so you know, I'm the guy who spent hours and hours in a classroom room learning how to write on a staff and arrange a four-part harmony with the different clefs and how to do leading voicing and write it out perfectly in classical format. And guess what? I haven't really used it at all since I left school. So if you want to go on the theory journey, I would recommend start learning something practical that is going to help you do what you want to do, like writing pop guitar. And then from that point, use theory to dissect what exactly you are doing. Because in my experience, a lot of people who write from a theory standpoint tend to make a lot of boring music. So with all of that out of the way, let's just jump into it. So to demonstrate the things I'm going to be showing you today, what I've done is I've taken a very simple guitar part, chord progression in E, and I've expanded it into the sort of multi-layered guitar part that I would use in a production project, just to sort of give you a before and after. And if you sit through this video, I will show you how to arrange it like this. So let's just jump into it. So the first thing to understand is that guitars kind of fit into pop music similar to synthesizers in the sense that they're a mid-range instrument that can kind of cover a lot of ground and they can kind of be a chameleon and fit into whatever you need them to do, which also makes it kind of intimidating to know where to start. So I'm gonna break down sort of three practical ways that I use guitar in songs. And these three ways are gonna be chords, extensions, and leads. Again, these are not technical terms. They're just the best way I can describe it. But let's start out with the chords. Chords is probably the easiest one to understand. Nine times out of 10, when you learn a song on guitar, you are just learning the chords. And before we dive into the psychology behind these chords, I wanted to give you guys this. So this is a chord chart that I made. Again, I will link it in the description. And I just went on to a chord builder online with Photoshop and just turned all of the chord shapes that I use all the time into a simple PDF. You don't need to give me your email. It's literally just a free Google Drive link in the description. But I feel like if you're going to learn anything from a technical standpoint, these are the best place to start for people who are sort of new to guitar. And so as we go through them, you'll see I have the chord name, but then also a number next to it. And really quickly, just in case you are not familiar, we want to go over the Nashville number system. And the Nashville number system sounds scary, but you get used to it pretty quick once you start using it on a regular basis. All right, essentially every note in a scale has a number. Number. There are some rare music theory exceptions, but for the most part, when we're talking about scales, we're talking about seven notes. And we actually have a little bit of a visual cue here. So we're starting on C, and if we're going through C major, which is all these lower keys, it goes like this. 
But what the Nashville number system is, is a way to contextualize chords based off of what the lowest note in that chord is. So if we are in the key of C major, and I play a C major chord, the lowest note on that chord is a C, which is also the first note of the C major scale. If I were to play a chord like an E minor, the lowest note of that chord is an E, which is the third note in the scale of C major. And again, it's really important to make sure that when you're using Nashville numbers, you're using them in the context of the key that you're playing in. So like C, is the one when we are in the key of C major. But if I'm in the key of G, it's now the four. And the reason why I made this distinction is because when you are in the pop world, the Nashville number is actually very useful in terms of communicating chord progressions. So for example, if I were to play something in G, let's say I take a one, a four, and a six, and a four. All right, that's a progression that a lot of songs use. If I understand Nashville numbers, I can now go to a completely different key and use that same pattern. So now I'm in C. D. E. I'm using the exact same progression for all of those. All I'm doing is changing the key that I'm playing and what chord shapes I'm using. And the reason why you would want to use chord shapes from one key over another is because they're actually used texture-wise very differently in music. And I'll explain more on that real quickly as we go through. So the first one we're going to go through is the key of G major. If you have ever heard a country song ever, they are using these chords. Even though you're not normally learning these exact voicings, these chords are used in pop all the time. So let me just play through all of these real quick. Again, I use this voicing particularly. If you want to, you can play them without your ring finger here on the B string. Also with this E minor, depending on whether or not I want the E minor to have a really full sound, I'll use either this E where I'm not playing those two bottom notes. Just makes it a little bit lighter and less dense. But if I want it to be dense, I can add those two lower ones. And then another thing to talk about real quick is that you can see that some of these numbers are like a one over three or a five over seven. I decided to write these down just because in the world of pop guitar, you are using these a lot. But the main reason that we don't really play the seven just as a regular seven is because, well, here, I'll show you real quick. If we just start going up the chords, one, two, three, four, five, six, we get a diminished chord which can definitely be used in a pop song. Oftentimes what people do in lieu of a seven is they'll play the five chord, but to recontextualize it, they'll play that seven in the bottom. In fact, you've probably heard this before. And in the guitar world, it just kind of makes it an easier transition. Like with these G chords, if we wanted to do a six, seven, one, instead of playing a seven, we'll play this five over seven here, which again is the same as this D shape. It's just, we have the low note as an F sharp, which is the seven. It's just in this style of music that tends to get used a lot more than actually playing a diminished. We then have chords that are in the key of C. Uh, if you want a reference for how they sound in a song, I would listen to Ed Sheeran's Happiness. Using these alternate versions where you're playing that low one. Sounds like this. So again, different flavors. We now have them in the key of D. These guys are used all over the brand new 1975 record, like almost every song. It's just the normal D shape. But uh, I personally think it's easier to get these other shapes if you just take your middle finger off and just let that open E ring. Again, we're in pop music, so we're not really afraid of twos. I really like using these a lot because A, my voice tends to play really well in the key of D, which is another reason why learning all these different shapes is really useful. But also one of the main chords that you're able to play really easy is the four. So it works really great for sort of moodier stuff. Mm -hmm. 
After that, we have these chords in E major, my preferred way of voicing them. This is actually one of those few voicings where you can actually hit that high octave. These guys are really fun because you have your two top strings sort of ringing out with every chord that you play. It has this very airy feel to it. These guys are a play on G major, but basically they're just triads that you can move around a bunch. If you want to hear an example of how these are used, I would listen to Guillotine by John Bellion. But yeah, here, let me just play through them real quick. After that, I thought I would throw in some R&B voicings, which is basically just pop with all sevens with a couple of other additions to it. Again, with these guys, you can kind of move them over to your top five strings or your lower strings, depending on how comfortable you want them to be when you're playing them. So with everything being in sevens here, you kind of have to decide what you want to do with your fifth. Like you can play it neutrally or you can actually make it a dominant seven chord, which those guys sound really spicy. If you want to know what a dominant seven feels like, try going from a four to a dominant three to the six. The cool thing about these shapes too, is that this is essentially the shape you wanna play if you're playing a major chord on the lower strings. Here's the shape you wanna play if you're playing on a minor chord on the lower strings. And then if you're playing on the higher strings, these three strings, you do this shape. And if you're on higher strings and you wanna play a minor chord, you do this shape. Like it's essentially just those same G chords, but we're adding sevens to them. Like right here, if we cut out this note right now and we just play that B. It's the same one that we use for that John Bellion type progression. Like I said, you can use diminished chords, but diminished chords in R&B stuff can be really useful when you're trying to walk between the five and the six. Like you want that chromatic movement between them, but you also want it to be a chord. That is everything for those chords. And the main thing that I want you guys to take away from all of these different chord voicings is that different voicings equal different textures. So for example, in this demo, the original version of this, I'm playing in E and I'm playing that sort of lower, chunkier version of E. But what I did here to sort of change the vibe of it a bit was A, I double tracked it. But what I did was I put a capo on my neck on the second fret and I played those D chord shapes. So I'm playing in the key of E, but I'm using D chord shapes and you can hear. That four that I start with at the beginning of the progression is actually like the lowest chord. So my lowest chord starts at the beginning of the progression, whereas here, my lowest chord is the E, which is like the second chord that I play, which again, isn't wrong, but it's a different emotion and it's a different texture. Another thing that is fun to do is if you have a guitar part already, you can use these different voicings and a capo to sort of add on top of them. So, so I have these two guys where I have the capo on the second fret and I'm playing in D, but then up here, you can hear how it's really high up there. That's because for that part, I'm still in the key of E, but I put a capo on the fourth fret and I'm using those C chord shapes. So even though I have two rhythm parts, they're not stepping on top of each other because they're in different ranges and their chords are voiced differently. Also, when you listen to them, they're sort of like playing different things rhythmically. So this original chord progression here, it's just sort of light strumming up and down with the thumb, which is not bad at all. I've done many songs like that. But because I wanted to expand this out to be this double tracked thing, plus another guitar, when I did these lower ones in D, I'm just doing strummed held out chords. Like I've simplified what I'm playing so that when this guy is here, it's finger picking and it's moving back and forth a bunch so that when I put the two of them together, they 
flow with each other and they don't feel like they're stepping on top of each other. This guy is also another great example of what I like to call chord extensions, which are the second thing that I wanted to talk about. Again, not a technical term, but an extension is a higher or lower voicing of a chord that's already being played. So we're not playing chords that don't exist already. We're just taking a chord progression that's already existing, already being played, and playing that progression again, but in a way that fits so that these two instruments can work together. So you guys are actually very familiar with extensions, specifically from one riff. Party in the USA is actually a great example of how to use extensions because even though I'm only playing these high strings decently high up on the neck, you can tell exactly what chords I'm playing. So assuming I'm in the right key, we have an F, an A minor, and a D minor, which are all the chords of the progression. You play those down here. And the reason why extensions are so cool is because once you know like these basic shapes, they're actually very practical for adding higher parts on top of a pre-existing guitar part or other instrument part. So here are the three major shapes that I use. And everybody knows this first one. It's like the basic D shape that everybody learns on guitar. But if you learn the other two higher shapes, you're actually able to play that D or transpose it to a different key if you want. And you're still able to find a voicing in an octave range that works without worrying. Because what will happen a lot of times is people will know one voicing, like the lowest one. And then they'll try it out and it won't really work in the mix that they have because it's too low. But then when they try moving it up the octave, it's too high. So these other chords... They give you two stopping points in between that. And then as you can see, we also have the minor version of these chords. These things are really useful. Another thing you can use extensions for is for seventh chords. So let's say I was playing this guy. Just a C major seven, which on the keyboard looks like this. Something you can do with extensions is right now we have this C major seventh chord. If I take that lowest note off, and just play the top three, it's an E minor chord. So if I'm in a progression where somebody is playing a C major seven, if I wanna add an extension on top of that, I can use one of those minor voicings that I just showed you and play an E minor. So in a sense, that's kind of what I was doing here. And then the last thing we're gonna look at today are leads. So I didn't bother writing them all out like I did with the chords because those chords took a long time. In the end, I did include one scale, which is the minor pentatonic. But if you're going to look up scale charts, I would recommend looking up your major scale and your minor scales, and then your pentatonic scale. Major or minor, in case any of you didn't know, they're the exact same notes. Like a major pentatonic scale and a minor pentatonic scale are the exact same notes. Really, the only difference is what position you start on. And the reason it's called the pentatonic scale is because you can see the one for all of our notes here. You can see that if we start on our first position, this green dot is our one. There's only five notes until we get to the next green dot, which is this an octave up. Like if you want to learn how to get leads in a, like a 1975 style, I would start with this because a majority of 1975 leads are just the pentatonic scale. I've actually had um, messages from guitar teachers being like, if I have another student come in and ask me how to play 1975 stuff, and I have to explain to them, it is just the major pentatonic scale for five albums. Just learn that and you've got it covered. But yeah, if I just take this one and I'll just start on the fifth fret, so this will be in the key of A minor. If I just sort of bounce between these notes here. Again, every 1975 song ever. But these are very useful when you come up with leads. So for this guy here, I wanted to add a little bit of a lead part. So I just noodled a little bit until I found a melody that I liked. Which is, again, just me messing around with that pentatonic scale. Which is really nice because in a major key, the pentatonic scale sounds very neutral, very clean. It's worth it to learn your major and minor scale too because they add some flavors that you can add as well. But pentatonic is the easiest to learn because there's less notes when you're starting out. And just to make it a little bit beefier, I doubled it underneath an octave. I think the key with pop stuff is keeping it simple. Don't worry about really impressing anybody. Writing something that is simple and catchy is actually way better than writing something that's technically difficult to play. So those 
those are like the three that I would focus on. So where do you start with all of this? First off, I would start with the chord chart and just start familiarizing yourself with these shapes. Start seeing if you can observe them being used in other productions. Once you feel more comfortable with those shapes, I would practice getting out a capo, putting it on the neck, and then switching up a chord shape so that you can double it up higher and see if that starts filling out some of the guitar sounds in your production work. And if you want to start getting into sort of melody stuff, I would start with a pentatonic scale, maybe just the first position, and start experimenting with playing that over a track. So if you have a track that's in G major, this second dot is going to be your root if you're in a major key. This green one is going to be what you start on with if you're in a minor key. And just start playing this scale up and down over that track and just start having fun with it and jamming with it and see what lead lines come out of that. Again, we're in pop music, so being sparse is actually preferred. But yeah, once you get comfortable with that, then I would start learning the other positions of the pentatonic scale just so you can be more comfortable doing it in any position in the neck. And then from there, I would progress to learning the major and minor scales. Those give you some more tonal characteristics that you can play with. But yeah, that's the video. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Let me know if you want more guitar lesson style stuff like this. Um, this video took a bit to make. So uh, if people would prefer to not see more videos like this, I would like to know because uh, there's a lot of time on this. But yeah, hopefully you guys feel equipped to write your own pop guitar stuff. I'll be returning to the regular format next week where we're going to be looking at Phoebe Bridgers. If you like this video, hit subscribe and all that stuff below. YouTube thinks these are the videos that you would like from me and I will see you guys next week.